you haven't met me already, my name is Julia. I work in the education department here at the Maritime Museum. This week, for Past to Present 2023, we are welcoming Cameron LaFollette. So Cameron LaFollette is a historian of the Northwest Coast, focusing on land use history, exploration, and shipwrecks, and early commercial natural resource extraction. She's also the executive director of Oregon Coast Alliance, which is a coastal conservation and land use protection organization. She was the lead researcher and author of all the his history articles in the 2018 Oregon Historical Quarterly Special Issue that investigated the 17th century Spanish galleon shipwreck on the Oregon coast, otherwise known as the Beeswax Wreck. Cameron has additionally lead authored two recent books on sustainability and ecological governance. Without further ado, please welcome Cameron LaFollette. Uh, 
Uh, so the sea otter story begins before the fur trade, of course, uh, and I'm going to talk about that just very briefly. I'm not going to concentrate on it because the question of what happened to Oregon sea otters uh, happened after the uh, long uh, experience between native peoples and sea otters. Uh, these next few slides are courtesy of my colleague Peter Hatch of the Siletz uh, tribe. Uh, and the importance of this slide is just to show you that all the coastal peoples in Oregon had a term for sea otter, uh, which, uh, you know, languages in general do not have terms for things that do not exist in their knowledge base, right? So uh, that is one indication that sea otters lived on the entire Oregon coast, which they did. Uh, another way of uh, telling this is looking at middens, um, the uh, uh, leftovers of villages and native activities which are on the coast. Uh, middens tell us that sea otters inhabited the entire coast, but they don't, a midden, midden research, which is archeological work, will not tell us the detailed population levels, nor will they tell us the exact locations. Uh, they also, uh, there's, if you look at the data underneath this map, um, the North Coast site, midden sites had more sea otter bones overall, the South Coast has the second not the largest number. Um, the part of the problem with middens is that they've often been washed away by erosion, a uh, common problem on the coast as we know, uh, or destroyed in later decades by building various things from dikes and jetties to highways. Um, the other problem with using middens to figure out what happened with otters uh, prior to the fur trade is that bone presence in middens doesn't tell us anything about the purpose of the use of sea otters by native peoples. Uh, so in general, and I'm only talking in general here on the coast, um, the details of this long relationship between native peoples and sea otters is being researched more uh, as we speak. But basically we could say uh, sea otters were important, highly important to native peoples. Um, otter pelts were used especially for winter robes. Uh, and someone who had one, uh, it really marked the owner as a person of wealth and prestige. Otter skins had roles as luxurious gifts. Um, there are many tales of otters and uh, humans in the coastal native traditions, and they all show philosophies of deep relationship between otters and humans. Uh, sea otter pelts were also traded among uh, coastal native groups along with other goods, uh, the Northwest Coast Natives all along the coast had a robust uh, trading network that extended far north and far south. They were very good uh, at sea uh, in the inland waters in canoes uh, and other boats like this. I want to read you a couple of brief descriptions of otter hunting by native peoples uh, on the south coast and the north coast because the natives of our area as well as further north were uh, exceptionally good otter hunters and that was uh, quite a skill to have because otters are, uh, were and are difficult to catch. So on the south coast, uh, Beverly Ward and Point Moccasin wrote, sea otters slept on their backs in the kelp weed patches, but they were wary little animals and dove down into the kelp weed so the hunters could only get a few at a time. Then they fought the rough water and waited for the sea otter to come up for air. When the crippled animals were harpooned and pulled in with a rope, they put up a vicious fight and sometimes the men got clawed and badly injured. Sometimes the canoe smashed against the rocks and the hunters did not come home. Uh, and then on the north coast uh, from uh, a uh, history by Mrs. Francis Victor Fuller, uh, writing in 1903, the canoes of these people, the Columbia River natives, were each cut out of a single log of cedar they were often 30 feet long and five wide at midships. The oars were about five feet long and bent in the shape of a crescent, which shape enabled them to draw edgewise through the water with little or no noise. This noiselessness being an important quality of hunting the sea otter, which is always caught sleeping on the rocks. Um, interestingly, just as a side note, there's, the historical sources are, are uh, contradictory about whether otters did or did not spend much time ashore. Uh, prior to the fur trade. Okay, now we'll get to the fur trade, which is where things started to happen to sea otters that were 
uh, ultimately led to their extermination almost across their entire range. The maritime fur trade uh, began with China. Uh, and it's a long story which I won't go into, but uh, it was the Chinese who started, began, founded, and maintained the market for sea otter pelts during the entirety of the fur trade that led to the demand um, being so high in China that it was worthwhile for the fur trade to, the international fur trade to begin. Uh, to go back a little bit before sea otters here, uh, Manchuria, the northern area in what's part, now part of China, uh, Manchurians conquered China beginning in 1644, uh, and the Ming Dynasty, which was the prior Chinese dynasty, collapsed. The Manchurians took about 40 years to consolidate their rule in China, but in the eyes of the conquered Chinese, the Manchurians were quote unquote barbarians uh, from the north uh, because they ate wild meat and they wore the furs of wild animals. It's cold up there in Manchuria, right? So they wore fox furs and sable furs and things like that. Uh, the nobility especially wore black fox and sable. Uh, the royalty wore sea otter furs, uh, but nobody underneath royalty was allowed to do it. Um, this uh, painting is of the Qianlong Emperor who reigned from 1735 to 1796 wearing royal robes, which as you can see are trimmed with sea otter fur. And that is the way the Chinese um, wore them, whereas the natives made essentially winter coats with two or three pelts, if you were you know, high enough up in the, in the social hierarchy to own one. The Chinese uh, used them differently as uh, trimming for royal robes, but in both cases they were uh, lux luxury items, uh, relegated only to the highest levels of the nobility. Uh, in China at this time in the 18th century under the Manchurians, those with close ties to the Manchu rulers, such as brides of imperial grandchildren and also fathers of the brides, would receive furs. Uh, beginning in about 1704, Manchurian rulers awarded black fox fur hats, otter fur war skirts, and sable riding gowns to honored soldiers. Uh, so although in the beginning, in the Chinese hierarchy of things, sea otter furs were only for the nobility, and royalty, uh, over time the market expanded and broadened out so more and more people could um, buy sea otter furs. Uh, in the 1700s, Chinese markets integrated and expanded and pretty much anyone wore a sea otter fur who could afford the price. Um, just following the Chinese thread here for a minute. In the last quarter of the 18th century and the early 19th century, uh, those were the times that were the most crucial to the maritime fur trade. The nearshore ecology that supports uh, the sea otters collapsed with all the hunting. And just to give you one terrible statistic, we are not going to, this is not a statistics class, we're not going to talk about numbers, but just one number to really uh, give you a sense of it. In 1806 uh, in Canton, there were 17,446 sea otter pelts from the best of the records could tell us imported. In 1831, they imported 321. Uh, 329, excuse me. So that's a drastic drop off, right? Um, in less than 30 years from 17,500 to 320. Uh, the average price per pelt, however, during that same time period, 1806 to 1831, quadrupled. Right, and that's sort of typical of markets. The more that the whatever it is is impossible to get and harder to find, the more the price goes up. So, uh, having looked now at that part of the fur trade, let's look um, a little bit more at what happened. Uh, having looked at the Chinese setting up the fur trade with their market demand, let's talk about what actually happened. Uh, Oregon is rarely mentioned in the annals of the fur trade uh, for several reasons, um, but the real question is who exterminated Oregon sea otters? And there's really two, two phases. The first is the maritime trade from about 1789 to 1820, in which Chinese demand incentivized both uh, incentivized natives to hunt for the Chinese market and the traders, mostly from Boston, to uh, be the middlemen taking the native pelts to Canton to sell. And then the second phase uh, of the extermination of sea otters was the local hunters, the local hunting in the latter part of the 19th century by um, natives of the coast and uh, 
Euro-American settlers on the coast, both again for the Chinese market, largely, largely for the Chinese market. Um, so now we're going to look, we're going to glimpse a little bit about what we can learn about sea otters from the uh, first part of the maritime fur trade, which is the maritime part. Historians generally date the maritime fur trade to publication of James Cook's third voyage journals. Uh, he died on that third voyage, as we know, but in the journals of the trip, he mentions the high prices that his crew were able to obtain for sea otter pelts uh, when they went to Canton. They had purchased sea otter pelts on the northwest coast, uh, north of Oregon, uh, from the natives, um, mainly for blankets. It was cold up there and they weren't uh, well enough clad, and so they purchased them mainly just for warmth. And then when they got to Canton, they discovered they could sell these pelts uh, for an enormous amount of money. Uh, and so once Cook's journals were published in England, it became immediately clear to the English that there was a space for uh, middlemen because the natives uh, of the Northwest Coast, who were the sea otter hunters, did not have the um, ships and the maritime commerce structure to get the pelts to Canton. The first ship to the Northwest Coast for the otter trade after James Cook's uh, journals were published was the British ship uh, sea otter, haha, what a name, uh, in 1789. Interestingly, the Americans took over the maritime trade within less than a decade. Um, the British were only active in the maritime fur trade really right at the beginning, and then the Americans took over, mostly from Boston, um, for historical reasons I won't go into, but that led to the natives of the Northwest Coast referring to the American traders as Boston men, and that's where that term comes from. Um, it's important to recognize here that the British and the Americans were traders, they were not the hunters. The hunting was done by the Northwest Coast Indians uh, in return for the valuable trade goods offered uh, by European or American trading ships. Uh, since uh, trade was at the, trade for sea otter pelts was uh, always, almost always at the initiative of the natives who had a long established trade network of their own. Uh, and so when a ship would come to the coast, anchor offshore or come into a harbor, the natives would come out in canoes uh, with sea otter pelts and other things to sell perhaps salmon for dinner or, or um, hats or uh, you know, other things. But, but they quickly learned that what the um, foreign traders wanted was sea otter pelts. Um, Natives in their own communities before the fur trade began traded many things of which sea otter pelts were one, and so they were um, always used to doing it. Um, this picture, which is my second most unfavorite picture of sea otter, um, <laughs> was drawn uh, on the James Cook voyages, and you can tell that uh, 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 Europeans were not yet very familiar with the sea otter because it's really not what sea otter looks like. Um, I just can't stand that picture. It looks like the sea otter is a combination of zoned out and infuriated. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's definitely not what a sea otter looks like. But, you know, that's the way it always is when uh, any group of people encounter something they've never seen before. It takes them a little while before they can, they really get a sense of what it's all about. Um, but that was one of the first images that Europeans and Americans saw of this marvelous animal that had magically soft fur. Uh, there was much um, competition among, once the maritime trading uh, period started, there was a lot of competition between traders on the Northwest Coast, especially in the areas which had high sea otter populations and good harbors, which was not Oregon, um, but up on Vancouver Island, the west coast of Vancouver Island, and uh, the Queen Charlotte Islands, now called Haida Gwaii, um, but that, that region on the inner side of Vancouver Island has had a large sea otter population, fairly quiet waters, and many harbors, and many native communities with skilled hunters. So that was a, a real um, major focus of the sea trade. Uh, on the south coast of Oregon, there are very few trade ship logs from the maritime trade era that we know of that mention trading on the south coast. Uh, there's very little data about Oregon, about sea otter populations on the south coast in this period. 
and very few even anecdotal accounts, account, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the, the log of the ship Ruby of 1795 mentions what uh, trading in what is now Coos County. And interestingly, there's, there's some conflict or some contradiction between uh, early reports. As few as they are, they're contradictory, which makes life even more difficult for the historian. Uh, but for example, the Jenny, which was a sister ship of the Ruby, um, and so it was a British trader, in the summer of 1791, reported few otter pelts for trading at the mouth of the Uncle River. But John Boyd recorded in the Columbia in April 1792, you know, just like six or seven months later, um, for the exact same place that we purchased of them many fine otter skins for copper and iron. So why was it not good in 1791 in the summer and was good in the spring of 1792? Maybe there were more hunters available at one time. Maybe they had just gone out on a hunting trip. Maybe uh, the sea otters had gone elsewhere. Uh, sea otters are not migratory, but they might have gone slightly elsewhere or you know, who knows. Um, but it's the kind of thing that makes what, looking at the records and trying to figure out what happened historically more difficult than it might other be, otherwise be. Um, the North Coast is uh, somewhat better in terms of the data that we have or the anecdotal evidence. <clears throat> Robert Gray, uh, he who was the first European American, uh, European or American, uh, up the Columbia, uh, and John Mears, who was British, both came to Tillamook County first in 1788. Uh, Gray entered Tillamook Bay to trade and barely escaped uh, the bay due to contrary winds after an altercation um, that led to uh, the death of a young crew member, which is well known and it's written out in the logs. The interesting thing about it is that Gray came into the into the Tillamook Bay only once, and it's not just because there ended up being conflict with the natives there. It's not a big enough bay for a major ocean-going sailing ship. It may look pretty good size when you're driving past it, um, but for a big ocean-going uh, ship to have room to turn around if the winds are blowing in a particular direction, it's really not a very good bay. Uh, and this was a constant refrain in ship logs um, dealing with Oregon, trying to find good harbors, or at least decent harbors. So Gray and Mears both tried Tillamook Bay and found that it didn't work very well. Um, but there was one harbor that did work, and that was the Columbia River Estuary, uh, the only documented harbor used by maritime traders during this uh, first maritime period is the Columbia River Estuary despite the treacherous bar, uh, and there were some ships who uh, really suffered quite a bit over the bar, but nevertheless, despite that, uh, it was the only harbor used. The others are too small. Uh, Gray in 1792 first entered the Columbia and saw the densely settled estuary. Trading began immediately because the peoples of the Columbia River estuary were um, very skilled and highly sophisticated traders. Uh, the ship journal recorded, uh, quote, observed that the canoes that came from downriver brought no otter skins, and I believe the otter constantly keeps in salt water. They, however, always came well stocked with land furs, meaning probably river otters, maybe also beaver, uh, and capital salmon. Uh, during our short stay, we collected 150 otter, 300 beaver, and twice the number of other land furs. That's practically the only account that actually gives a number of sea otter pelts um, collected in any given place on the Oregon coast. Uh, after 1795, at least 12 to 14 ships wintered part or the whole winter uh, in the Columbia River estuary trading, which indicates A, that it was a good harbor, uh, and B, that there were presumably otters and other furs to trade, um, and, and a native population that was familiar with trading, sophisticated at it, and considered it an ordinary part of their cultural life. Um, and here I want to take a slight detour and mention two other items that became a part of the fur trade in Oregon. When traders first came into the Columbia uh, for furs, they also discovered other items that would be valuable uh, to purchase on the Columbia and then take further north and trade for sea otter pelts up north in Alaska, like, for example, among the Clinkid. 
Uh, and so there were two other items that, the, that two other major items that traders could purchase in Oregon uh, for trade goods along the Columbia and then take north. And the first one of these was what you see in the slide here, um, clamels they were called, uh, stiffened elk hide armor. Several ship logs mentioned going to the Columbia River to buy clamels from the Chinook uh, because the clamels were uh, much in demand further north, such as by the Clinket, and they would pay in sea otter pelts the otters that they themselves had um, hunted. So <clears throat> uh, there are some ship logs that say we went to the Columbia and purchased 50 clamels. Now these are all you know, handmade and hand pounded and hand tanned, so that's quite the industry to have of uh, clamels being made by the Chinook and class of people on the Columbia River. The second item uh, is, it was, um, slaves. Uh, Northwest Coast Native societies were generally slaveholding cultures. Slaves were owned by the wealthy, uh, by the title holders. Uh, by all historical accounts, the Chinook and the peoples of the Columbia Mouth region were a vigorous slave raiding and trading group of the Northwest Coast raiding trade tribes far to the south for slaves and then uh, selling them to the north. It's very difficult actually to tell how intimately the slave trade got linked with the sea otter trade because captains didn't usually mention this in their writings. And we're talking about the early 1800s, so in the United States it was half a century before the Civil War, uh, but slavery was already a, a controversial issue in American culture even though the Northwest Coast was not part of the United States nor part of Great Britain, but it was already a controversial issue, and so captains would not, if they dealt in slaves as part of the Seattle trade, they generally didn't you know, go on about it in public. Um, but we have a little bit of information about it uh, from this gentleman. Uh, Otto von Kotzebue was a Russian naval lieutenant, and in his 1821 memoir, he said, <coughs> For the purpose of buying slaves, the American ships repaired to the northwest coast of America at latitude 45, that is to say, the Columbia, uh, where the population is numerous. Perceiving that they are better paid for men than skins, the natives turn to the horrible trade of kidnapping. They find it easy to overpower tribes in the interior and barter them with the ships for clothes. When in this manner the ship is well loaded with slaves, they go north as high as latitude 55 degrees where the natives purchased these people for slavery, uh, paying in sea otter skins. Uh, one captain, one American captain that we know of, uh, actually wrote in his own correspondence about having a slave, <coughs> uh, Captain George Ayers of the Mercury, uh, which was out of Boston, um, and he was captured as a smuggler in um, New Spain off the coast of what's now Santa Barbara by the Spanish in 1813 and detained for the rest of his life in New Spain. He never got back to the United States at all. But when the Spanish, or when the privateer came on board to capture the crew, uh, one of the things, <laughs> things that Captain Ayers had was a young um, Columbia River Indian about 10 years old, which as he said, was a slave that he had purchased on the Columbia. Um, and that's in the Spanish records, so we know, uh, and know at least in a couple of instances when it actually happened. Um, next effort to glimpse the otters, um, early explorers and fur traders by land. Uh, we'll start with the south coast in uh, Coos County, Alexander Roderick McLeod expedition in 1826-27. Um, traded for sea otter pelts, among other things, on the south coast. The Jedediah Smith expedition of the south coast in 1828 uh, was trading for sea otter pelts and other furs in the Coos Bay region. Um, also, this expedition was cut short by a massacre of the ex 15 of the expedition's men on the Umpqua River uh, due to misunderstandings and unresolved grievances. But if you read the journals of the expedition before that, uh, they came up the coast. They were also uh, bringing horses and mules up the south coast. And by the way, there weren't a lot of trails. So, uh, you know, if you know anything about the vegetation of the coast, which you probably do, um, you know, they had much to do to get their four-legged animals up the coast. They managed it eventually. Um, but if you read the journals, uh, 
sea otter pelts and beaver pelts and river otter pelts were constantly being traded as part of the expedition. Um, in Lincoln County, the Central Coast, again, uh, Alexander McLeod journeyed, uh, journeyed to the Alsea in the summer of 1826, exploring the Aquinnah River, Beaver Creek, down the Sayusaw trapping and hunting. Um, <clears throat> in 1832, all these early explorers uh, worked for, at least contracted with, uh, what later became the major fur companies, like the Hudson's Bay Company, or the Northwest Fur Company. And, uh, in 1832, the Hudson's Bay Company attacked um, the Yupuna people in retaliation for the killing of two trappers by the Al Sea. And a part of that tragedy is it was not the Yupuna people who did the killing of trappers, it was a different group of people. There's other aspects of the tragedy, but that's one of them. Um, a native Yupuna spoke to an uh, anthropologist many years later and said, uh, Coquel Thompson and Athapaskan told anthropologist John Harrington that the hunters, quote, came trapping to that lake inland of where Seal Rock is, and the party stayed there all winter, getting beaver skins, sea otter skins, muskrat skins just piled up. The Alsea and Yaquina people did not know how many beaver hides they got, maybe 200 pounds, and fisher skins like sea otter. So, you know, again, it's all anecdotal evidence, but it makes it clear that there were um, sea otters and quite a few in the area. Then Clatsop County, uh, we know about this group of explorers. Uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition wintered November 1805 to uh, March 1806 in Clatsop County. There's more than 25 references in the journals to trading with the Clatsop, Tillamook, and Chinook people for sea otter pelts. Uh, it's the single largest body we have of material we have about what happened with the early fur trade in Oregon. <clears throat> For example, Clark wrote on uh, 18, in March 1806, the women also wore a robe much smaller than that of the men. It's like that of the men, hangs loosely over the shoulders and back. The most esteemed and valuable of those robes are made of strips of the skin of the sea otter net together with the bark of the white cedar or silk grass. Uh, sea otter pelts were highly esteemed as Lewis and Clark uh, learned quickly. <coughs> especially robes of two to three skins. As Joseph Whitehouse noted uh, in his journal entry in November 1805, I mentioned this in order to show the high value that they set on these skins, which were very beautiful. Um, Lewis and Clark also reflected what we know from other sources as well, that the Clatsop and Chinook were connoisseurs in the arts of bargaining. Uh, Clark wrote in December 1805, they are close dealers and stickle for a very little Never close a bargain except they think they have advantage. Value blue beads highly. White they also prize, but not other color do they value in the least. And there were several instances in which Lewis and Clark wanted to buy one or another's uh, pelt and were not able to do it because they didn't have enough blue beads. And they tried all kinds of other uh, things that the Indians might wanted, and they said, no, no blue beads, no Seattle pelts. picture. Um, this might or might not be a uh, painting of Chief and Conley. Uh, it's the historical provenance this painting is not clear. It may very well be just kind of a, you know, a pastiche of something from Plains Indians, but it is the only thing we have, so I put it up despite uh, it being questionable. Uh, Chief and Conley was uh, you know, the fur trade gave the natives opportunities to have fur empires, not only the traders had fur empires. Um, and Chief Conconley was the most well-known. Um, he played off the traders, uh, British and American traders off against one another very astutely, uh, and was able to amass a very large fur empire by working with and trading with other tribes in the area. He's very frequently mentioned in trader literature of the period, just two brief citations about that. Alexander Henry, who was uh, an employee of the Northwest Company, it came to Astoria as part of the transfer of Astoria to the British in the War of 1812. Uh, and he described in his journal of Conley's wealth of furs, his fur empire, and his canny far flung trading activities in the region. Uh, and then Father Pierre Jean de Smet, de Smet uh, who uh, visited Fort Vancouver, which was Hudson's Bay Company headquarters, 
1846, and he heard stories of Conley, who had died in 1830, that he would come to the fort with 300 slaves and carpet the walkway to the fort door with beaver and sea otter skins for him to walk on. Possibly a little exaggeration there, but uh, but you get the basic idea. You know, Conley really had a, a, a large fur empire. So now we're gonna do a uh, good thing the sea otters through the fur companies, um, not the explorers that were the kind of the first ones out from the fur companies, the actual fur companies themselves. Before John Jacob Astor came and founded this town, and before the Hudson's Bay Company came in and um, ruled the Columbia Department, the very first effort at a uh, fur fort on the Columbia uh, was at Oak Point, and this is a painting of that. Uh, the Winships were a family of boat builders and uh, maritime traders from the Boston area. And they wanted to win the contest to set up a trading post on the Columbia River. It was clear that somebody was going to do it. The Russians were interested, the Americans were interested, the British were interested, somebody was gonna do it. They wanted to be first. So they sent Nathan Winship, uh, one, of the, the one of two brothers commanding sea otter hunting ships, um, and I say hunting on purpose, I'll get to that later why I said hunter rather than trader. So they sent Nathan Winship, captain of the Albatross, uh, to do so. The family back in Boston, for reasons that nobody knows, decided on a location for this fort at some 30 miles up the Columbia, like in an area where the boats had trouble sledging through the mud and the branches, a place where other trading ships were never going to go not at the mouth where Australia eventually was founded, but 30 miles up. I don't know who, I mean, it's clear that there was a lot of thinking, but not a lot of local geography involved in that decision. <laughs> so they decided on the location 30 miles up the Columbia, far from the river mouth, in almost non-navigable waters, far from anywhere maritime traders would ever be going. Uh, purpose, as it says in their uh, writings, quote, to procure the skins of sea otter, beaver, mink, fox, bear, sable muskrats, and in fact, any production suitable for the China or American market. They were, Nathan Winship was to purchase land from the natives, build a two-story house, and make a garden, you know, for food, um, not flowers. Uh, they, before they came up to Columbia, they stopped off in Hawaii and picked up 25 extra hands who would man the fort. Possibly it didn't occur to anyone that although the Hawaiians were good pioneers, good sturdy people, they didn't know anything at all whatsoever about the Northwest, neither the peoples nor the ecology. Um, they, so they got 30 miles off the Columbia and they began building the fort at Oak Point, which uh, this painting shows. <coughs> the problem was it flooded in a single night's rain. They had to move the half-built house downstream and begin again. Another problem with local geography, lack of knowledge. Uh, then they found that the natives of the area were becoming increasingly hostile gathering with weapons. Uh, some of the chiefs came alongside the ship and said they didn't want the Americans that deep in their territories. It would, it would cut them out um, of the, it cut them out as middlemen um, in the trade and they didn't want that. It wasn't a question of not wanting Americans in the territory in general, but they didn't want themselves to be cut out of the trade as middlemen. Uh, and things got worse and worse and Nathan Winship intelligently decided this was maybe not such a great idea after all, uh, and he picked up his men and sailed back down the Columbia River, and that was that. However, next year, uh, <coughs> the Pacific Fur Company, uh, John Jacob Astor, founded Fort Astor, uh, and much more intelligently, it was at the Columbia map, rather than way up the stream. Um, it was surrendered to the British in 1812 as part of the War of 1812 and renamed Fort George and managed as a uh, fur trading fort by the Northwest Company until it returned to U.S. sovereignty in 1818. Um, and interestingly, when it was returned to American sovereignty, um, the, the provost to the Secretary of State wrote, a few days thereafter, to wit, on the 6th, I received in the name of the United States the possession of the establishment of Fort George. This outlet at the mouth of the Columbia embraces the entire range of country from the ocean to the mountains. The ocean teems with otter, Mustela lithica, which is the otter's old name, 
the seal and the whale. So still by the early uh, 19th century, there were apparently plenty of otters in the area. Um, <coughs> the Hudson's Bay Company and the Northwest Company merged in 1821. They were having, uh, the British government felt, unseemly fights that were not assisting in getting the work done. So they were forcibly merged and they had three forts in our region. Fort Vancouver, which was the headquarters, uh, Fort George, which was the headquarters before Fan Fort Vancouver, and Fort Umpqua further south. John McLaughlin, the chief factor of the Columbia District at Fort Vancouver from 1824 to 1845, oversaw uh, Hudson's Bay operations in our area. Now, the thing to remember about the Hudson's Bay Company with respect to the sea otter is, the Hudson's Bay Company really focused on beaver. They were not a sea otter company. Um, they didn't have the setup for extensive trading on sea otters, and they also didn't have the setup for hunting. They didn't hire native hunters. They didn't have uh, Anglo-European hunters, sea otter hunters. Um, they only took sea otter pelts if they were offered. Um, but interestingly, every year, when you look at the actual records of the Hudson's Bay Company, every year, among the hundreds or even thousands of pelts of other animals, there were always a few sea otter pelts. They were always the smallest number of pelts, and they commanded the highest price by orders of magnitude. So they were clearly still there. Whether or not the small numbers is because they weren't hunted very much, or because there weren't very many left, we don't know. Then we get to the other player on the Northwest Coast, the Russian American Company. The Russians, <coughs> discovered Alaska for themselves in the Midas Bering Voyage of 1741. The first Russian settlement in Alaska at Three Saints Harbor on Kodiak Island in 1784 was by a fur trader named Gregory Shotokov. The Russian American Company was chartered in 1799 to bring order to the Russian sea otter hunting trading entrepreneurs in the Aleutians in Alaska, which was a really a free-for-all. It was otter hunting uh, to the max with no ideas of sustainability. It was also coercing uh, the native Aleutians at the point of a gun to do the hunting, and there were a lot of uh, ugly things, massacres and so on, that finally came to the attention of the Russian government in St. Petersburg, and they put the clamp on the situation by founding a monopoly, a monopoly company to control uh, the free-for-all. Uh, Governor of the Russian American Company during this crucial period was Alexander Baranov, painting of him here. Uh, the Russians, um, they initially wanted to expand into the Columbia, but uh, Baranov uh, recognized that Americans had a strong interest in the Columbia region and were very likely to be the first ones to build a fort there, which turned out he was right about that. Um, plus, he sent a colonizing ship down south, who was called the Nikolai, um, and it wrecked uh, on the Olympic Peninsula in 1808. Some people died, others were uh, enslaved by the Maca, who were a slaveholding culture. Uh, and so the Russians eventually decided to uh, establish their southern fort at Fort Ross in Northern California, and it's now a California um, state park. So the important thing about the Russians, apart from their presence on the Northwest Coast at all, is they actually hunted sea otters. Uh, how did they do this? Because the Russians themselves were not sea otter hunters, but uh, they conquered the Aleutian and Kodiak peoples who were highly skilled um, hunters, and they had a system of forced labor contracts, mainly with Kodiak hunters, um, to hunt the sea otters for them. So unlike all the Boston men who traded with the natives who did the hunting, the Russians had uh, Kodiak, mainly Kodiak hunters who did the hunting for them. Uh, so Baranov did, Governor Baranov did an additional um, interesting maneuver. He began to contract with the captains of some American trading ships to carry Kodiak hunters down to California and hunt otters down there, and then bring the furs back up to Sitka and divide them half and half. There weren't a lot of captains that Baranov trusted to do this, maybe six or eight. But the hunts were uniquely destructive because there were 30 to 50 Kodiak hunters on board these ships. And they went down to California and they slaughtered sea otters right and left. I mean, the Kodiaks were really excellent hunters. They knew how to do it. That would provide prestige in their cultures. 
Um, the uh, Piranha's first contract with an American captain was in 1804 with Joseph O'Kane, captain of a ship called the O'Kane. Uh, the question is about this Russian um, hunting contract business. Did it include Oregon? Uh, you know, Sitka is up north, California is down south, Oregon's in the middle. Um, did they stop and do sea otter hunting with the Kodiak countries in Oregon? Unfortunately, I can tell you that we don't know. Um, it's possible that uh, it did. It's possible that it didn't. Um, there's just no way to tell. No existing literature says anything about it really one way or the other. Um, part of the problem was that Oregon at this time was not a defined region with a name or identity among the contending colonial powers. So nobody would write in their ship log, um, you know, we took our Kodiak hunters into, you know, Depot Bay and got 50 sea otters. That kind of information just doesn't exist. Um, so now we're gonna go to the final glimpse of sea otters. The end of our population was in the local hunting that occurred with natives who were still on the coast, not on reservations, uh, and the American settlers who came in and who learned about sea otter hunting from the, from the natives. Um, we're talking about the period here from about 1860 to 1910 when the last otters ended. So again, starting in Curry County, um, there appear to have still been otters in Curry County in the 1850s and 60s and then dwindling on down. Um, the Willamette Farmer newspaper in 1886 had an article about the events at Battle Rock in 1851, which was a, a skirmish between uh, potential settlers and the native peoples there. Uh, and in the article, and the article goes into the whole what happened, but part of what they say is, the discovery of the white port orphan cedar was made then and it existed in immense forests. There were great flocks of pigeons and sea otter were seen in the water nearby, while signs of elk, deer, and bear were all around them. There's a most interesting uh, Pacific Fisheries report um, from 1893. <coughs> that notes that the, due to high prices in 1891, there was an intense sea otter hunt started up between Cape Blanco and the Rogue River down south. Um, there were 20 otters killed in 1891, 13 in 1892, and 17 in 1893. So in a way that's not a lot, but on the other hand, the fact that there were still that many otters uh, after an intensive hunt tells us that there still was hugely diminished, but at least some kind of population um, at that time. Um, and then, it, but it dwindles after that. Like it says, there was another article in 1892, Charles Crew of Port Orford killed a fine sea otter last week, meaning one. Um, local newspaper reports from 1895 to 1910 in Curry, Curry County mention at least five local sea otter hunters by name. Uh, it's the only region of the coast where we actually have the names of some local sea otter hunters in the late 19th century. That indicates that there was surely a sizable sea otter cottage industry, hunting cottage industry in uh, Curry County, later on the coast apparently than any other part of the coast. Uh, Coos County, marching here north slowly, um, <coughs> there's a very helpful or, uh, article in Harper's uh, magazine from Oregon from October 1856 um, that discusses uh, the trip of one William Wells to the wildlands of the Northwest Coast uh, in that time period. He had all kinds of adventures, but one of the things he went to do is um, hunt sea otters and, uh, in Coos Bay, and he reports that they shot two females with pups. So again, there's another piece of anecdotal information, sad, tragic anecdotal information, um, that uh, there was still a breeding population of sea otter um, females with pups. Sea otters were still mentioned in Coos County in articles from 1885, even 1904 and 1907, but just one at a time, like this one from 1907. A sea otter worth $500 was found on the beach the other day by William Height. He had been killed by the surf among the rocks. Uh, Lincoln County, getting further north here, sea otters were mentioned as late as 1896 and 1902, but only remnant populations. Um, 
1902, the Corvallis Times said, the valley, this valuable skin is the property of Joseph Briggs, who was a half Celeste, half Anglo um, set, uh, person on the coast, who killed the animal in the ocean just off of Otter Rock. The otter was shot by Mr. Briggs while it played in the surf, two or three hundred yards from shore. The feat was a difficult one. Um, when we get up to Tilpa County, the amount of information that we have plummets drastically down to zero. And I mean like really zero. There's no information of any kind whatsoever about sea otter hunting uh, in Tillamook County, which is really strange. No local newspapers, no early settler accounts, no other documents. Um, and it's not clear what that is, but it may have to do with the fact that the um, coast reservation in this area uh, was covered much of Tillamook County's coastal region in the mid 19th century, which would mean that the whatever sea otter hunting was taking place was taking place on the reservation or uh, with partnerships between settlers and Indians on the reservation and it didn't make it into any formal uh, documents. At least we presume that that's what happened because there's just no other information at all. Uh, then we get up to Clatsop County finally. Um, sea otters were probably first extirpated in the Columbia region because this is the one harbor that everybody used. You have 12 to 14 trading ships wintering every winter for you know, 10 or 15 years trading the whole time. They probably you know, were able to uh, work closely enough with the natives that the natives could scour out uh, all the sea otters remaining. Uh, as of 1889, news articles in Classic County were reporting that the sea otters had almost disappeared. Um, this schooner, after its wreck, obviously, uh, is the Kate and Ann, uh, was built in Oregon and uh, it functioned from 1883 to 1898 as if things were, as if it was back in 1795 when you could just sail around and kill marine mammals or trade with marine mammals the natives killed. Uh, and there were lots around, but in their time, uh, there were very few. Uh, they mainly did some sealing. They had a little bit of sea otter hunting on the Oregon coast, uh, and they had no success except for three smallish pelts, as the records tell us. Um, it was wrecked in 1902 in the Channel Islands of California, and there you see it in the sands. Uh, the Daily Astorian in March of 1887. Um, there isn't much in the fur trade of Astoria to furnish an item at present. Still a little is doing. Beaver pelts come in and are quoted at 350 per pound. Land otter skins, that is river otter, uh, scout, sell at $5 each. Few sea otter skins, and they are the way from $60 to $125. So it's the classic market thing, right? The demand is high, the opportunity is low, and the opportunity to catch is low, and so the um, prices skyrocket. So then we have um, population collapse and extirpation, and there were many um, laments in the newspapers. I will just make you suffer through two of them. Uh, the Medford Mail Tribune in 1910, sea lion hunters off the Oregon coast have had a good season. In two months, one schooner's crew killed 40 sea lions and one otter. The skin of the latter is worth 300 to 500. See, it's you know, escalating. The further we go along, the more expensive it is. Uh, and then the newspaper article ends, it is rare that a sea otter is killed on the Oregon coast. Right. Uh, and then finally, the Sunday Oregonian in 1913. The sea otter is one of the furs that already cannot be bought. It is an example of what other precious furs will be in the near future. The poor beast has been persecuted out of existence. And that was true. I was thought for a while that all sea otters had been extirpated permanently off the planet, but um, there were a few uh, hiding out in rocky bays in remote parts of Alaska and also in California. And so the sea otter has been able to rebound um, to some extent a part, a, 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 across a part of its range. So the solution to this uh, extirpation problem um, is that we can restore sea otters, and they have been restored in several areas. Uh, unfortunately, when Oregon tried to do a translocation in 1970, it didn't work. Uh, the translocation was in 1970-71. 93 otters from Amchitka Island in Alaska were translocated to the south coast off Coos Bay and Port Orford. 
um, all vanished within 10 years of their release, uh, but even though there was only about 8% known mortality. So what happened? Did they emigrate home? Were they killed? Did they disperse? Was it the wrong subspecies? Did they go join the Washington otters who were also released at the same time and whose translocation uh, was successful? I don't know. The problems with a new translocation now um, <coughs> are several of the sorts you might expect. One is adequate habitat. Uh, the location of best habitat has changed thanks to diking, jetties, and kelp destruction by climate change. In general, uh, what we know from native sources about where coastal tribes describe otter hunting, such as at Otter Rock, Yuclin Head, Sunset Bay, Whiskey Run Beach, Rogue River Reef, is roughly where modern habitat modeling shows author, uh, otters would thrive. It's not an exact fit, but roughly. Of course, another problem with sea otter translocation is human disturbance. Um, since <coughs> otters have been gone for about a century, the last the last newspaper article that I could find about a sea otter being killed in Oregon was in 1910. So somewhere in there is when they were uh, dis when they disappeared. So there's conflicts with fisheries, um, not salmon fisheries. Otters don't chase around after salmon, um, but they do eat crab. And uh, Oregon's largest commercial fishery is Dungeness crab. It's about 40 million dollars annually. In some parts of Alaska and other areas. Crabs are a favorite sea otter prey. There's also a potential conflict with boating, crabbing, and shipping. <coughs> um, there's been some recent studies looking at the possibilities. Uh, uh, OSU master's graduate student who has since graduated and gone on to other things, uh, Dominique Cohn, did his thesis on Oregon reintroduction scenarios in December of 2019. And his principal habits, his principal findings included the following: habitats will most uh, sea otters will most likely thrive along the southern coastline, where there are high quality nearshore reefs at Orford, Blanco, and Simpson. Uh, secondarily, just north of Newport and the north coast near the Columbia, uh, there's little sea otter habitat in the existing marine reserves. Also, Oregon generally has bull kelp rather than giant kelp which is less persistent annually and provides less cover and prey. And more recently than that, uh, we've had a real die off of kelp. Mm -hmm. Which makes the situation even worse. Um, Oregon has a lot of small estuaries and they have a good sea otter prey base. All high density habitats are within 50 kilometers of at least one estuary or another. But all the areas for potential introduction have high potential spatial conflict with human activities, but not necessarily high intensity. That is, the question, the question is, so there's clearly going to be some otter human conflict with reintroduction. The question is how much and what kind and can it be managed for and how best to do that. Uh, and that is something, this is an area possible general area for reintroduction. Um, the Alaka Alliance, which Alaka is the uh, Chinook word for sea otter, the Alaka Alliance is working towards a new sea otter translocation, um, currently doing feasibility and economic studies with an eye towards getting sea otters back in the water uh, as soon as possible. And there we go, look at that. Uh, they hang out, uh, sea otters in, hang out in rafts, as they're called. Uh, to sleep and to hunt and for uh, presumably also for protection. Thank you very much. Uh, before I end, I just want to add here that, um, you know, full disclosure, I'm on the board of the Alaka Alliance and doing some of the history work. And we have two members, of, uh, two staff members of the Alaka Alliance in the audience if people are interested in learning more about the uh, current uh, work on translocation. Jane McCary, the executive director, and Chanel Hasten, the communications director, they raised their hands there in the back. If you would like to speak to either of them afterwards about the current effort in Oregon, um, be my guest. And so I'll leave it there for questions.
so I'm going to come around with the microphone for questions. If you just raise your hand, I'll walk over to you and then please speak into the mic to ask the question so everyone can hear you. And don't tell me I waved you out so much that nobody has any questions. <laughs> All right, in the back. Uh, in addition to the incredibly good insulation in their fur, they also consume, I, I think I remember a figure, 40% of their body weight a day. To yeah, something, survive yeah, something like that. Um, the, I didn't get into the whole biological reason that sea otters are important. They, a, a favorite prey in most areas is sea urchins. Sea urchins eat kelp. So if there's sea otters present, eat sea urchins, and the sea otters, the, the sea urchins can't eat the kelp, and we have better, more productive kelp forests. Um, without the sea otters, the kelp forests are much more vulnerable to predation by um, sea urchins, and that has been a problem apart from climate change uh, in many areas. And of course, we have to remember that during the fur trade era, nobody knew, nobody understood these ecological important things. You know, they were, the sea otters were an opportunity for uh, natives to receive value trade goods and Boston traders to receive profits when they sold the pelts. The sort of deeper implications of what everybody was doing were not apparent. I like to think of the fur trade era as um, honestly and straightforwardly as possible by saying, this was a time when sea otters had no friends. <laughs> everybody was out for the sea otters for their own gain. The Chinese for their gain, the natives for their gain, the Americans for their gain, and the Russians for their gain. Everybody was out for the sea otter and they had no friends. There's a lesson for us all in that, right? Um, so hopefully we can restore that or come back from that terrible state of affairs. Make me walk so far. <laughs> Um, the last issue of National Geographic just came out yesterday or the day before. Right. A very extensive article about the others, life cycles, health, all that kind of stuff. If anybody's interested in, in learning more. Yes, uh, National Geographic did just do a major article about sea otter restoration, um, conflicts, life cycles, biological importance. Uh, part of the I mean, there's so, there's so many other aspects of the current situation that I haven't gotten into. Y'all should have another another um, talk about the current situation, because it's a whole other story with the population in California and how it's doing, uh, the populations in Alaska, which are booming in some areas uh, and um, doing very well and even better than well and causing conflicts of a different sort, uh, and the importance of the a sea otter to kelp production. Um, so if you go online and just Google um, National Geographic and sea otter article 2023, I think it just came out this month, um, you can find a lot more information. I noticed um, in one of the maps that you showed earlier that um, some of the remaining population on the uh, northwest coast for sea otters is still a little bit um, northern Washington state. Um, it looked kind of like somewhere near San Juan Island and that coast. Is there a reason why that population would be extremely tame longer than um, being wiped out by the fur trade since like in only here? The population in Washington is um, only results from a translocation also done in 1970 the same as in Oregon, uh, it did not survive. I mean, the earlier Washington population was exterminated as it was in Oregon. But there was, uh, the translocation from Anchica Island happened in Washington and Oregon at the same time. And for reasons that are unclear, especially since the Washington translocation had fewer numbers of otters than the Oregon one, um, the Washington population, although it took an initial dip, did eventually come back. So the the population now that's around the Olympic Peninsula results from that 1970 translocation. Uh, there hasn't been any research or much research that I'm familiar with about 
how the fur trade impacted the Washington otter population. The most work on sea otter history has been done in California, uh, where these Russian hunting events took place, and up in Alaska because of the Russian American Company. Um, but there's not a lot of research about what happened in between, which is why I started doing this work to try to get us some information, however sketchy, about what happened here. I'd like to ask a couple of questions about how river otters are in our area here. Yeah, so river, river otters and sea otters are, you know, so to speak, cousins. Um, and part of the reason that people get confused when uh, thinking they sighted a sea otter is the river otters can come down to the coast and uh, use coastal habitats, but they are primarily freshwater animals and not um, sea animals like sea otters are. River otters suffered a lot during the fur trade also, uh, not as much as sea otters, but as sea otters became more rare, more valuable, and harder to get, river otters, uh, along with beavers, took a big hit. I don't know of any studies that have really looked at what happened to river otters during the fur trade and whether uh, it would be appropriate or helpful or necessary to restore them. I, just, I haven't seen any research on that, I just don't know. Well, well the reason I ask is I have them living underneath my house sometimes. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, that, that I don't know. Um, I do know that the Alaska Alliance uh, sometimes gets reports of sea otters, and when, when we start to ask, so was it on its back? And then, no, it was scampering along the ground and had a wonderful long tail. That's a river otter. Yeah, I'm very familiar with them. <laughs> yeah, but a, lot of people, but a lot of people aren't, because uh, I mean, they don't see river otters all that often, and they almost never see a sea otter. That's great. Uh, Thank that's you. really lovely. Thank you for all the other information. A lot you didn't know about the, uh, how the Indians hunted before the intermediate trade and everything. The fox and trout that was stopped in the way. Thank you. So are you, are you collecting any rent from them things? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they paid rent. rent. They pay me a scat. <laughs> <laughs> We have time for one more question. Hi. Um, so, since you are, since the Alaska Alliance is still working on kind of doing the research on like what would another sort of translocation look like, and some of the issues you've kind of talked about is the kelp forest, like is their research or work being done to then restore the kelp forest specifically in relation to sea otter impacts? If that's a question that I, I probably don't want to answer, I would rather that you talk to Jamie Carey, our executive director, afterwards. Um, restoring kelp forest is a whole other animal, um, and how to do it and where to do it and the differences of how to restore bull kelp versus uh, other kinds of kelp. Um, and the relationship of being able to restore a kelp forest in the absence of um, uh, sea otters and or um, sea stars that eat sea urchins. There's a very complicated um, trophy cascade, to use the term of art, uh, involved in that, and I better not say anything lest I say something stupid. <laughs> but please do talk to Jane um, afterwards about that. She will have more information than I will. Yes, says our communication director. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so we will put the sea otter pelt over there and I invite you to go pet it. Uh, and then you will understand why the fur trade happened and why it was, um, why the Chinese loved the fur so much that they were willing to pay astronomical prices until there were no sea otters left. All right, let's give one last round of applause. <laughs> Cameron mentioned we'll have the sea otter pelt over on this table over here as well as, well as the email sign up sheet. Um, next week's speaker will be Morgan Hyam. She is a wildlife photographer who has won international awards for her research work and she just so happens to live in Astoria. So she'll be here next week Tuesday. Um, friendly reminder if you haven't already please make sure that you check in with the front desk just so we can keep track of our numbers for these events, that's important to us for future planning. Um, and last but not least, we have some adult education programs coming up with slots that are still open. Just a couple more spots open for the Charcuterie Sailor's Valentines on February 10th and 11th. So you could get a chance to make a Sailor's Valentine that would normally be created from seashells and this time it's gonna be entirely meats, cheeses, crackers, pickles, all that good stuff. <laughs> we also have the Kyotaku fish printing class with artist Duncan Berry. He's coming up from Cascade Head on February 24th and 25th. So you can sign up for that. It is over Fisher Poets Weekend. It'll keep your schedule nice and busy and you would go home with some really amazing prints working with him. Last but not least, there is going to be a registration opening up tomorrow for a March Beginners Watercolor class with Lindsay Arts. She's another local artist around here, participates in all kinds of art fairs, is featured in a lot of our local galleries, and she'll be walking all of her students step by step through the beginning stages of watercolor painting. So thank you very much for coming this morning, and we hope we'll see you all again next week. <laughs>